during this one day in Washington, D.C. Nearly 659,000 D.C. residents wake up. One million people go to work. Thousands of tourists fill our sidewalks. During this one day in D.C., we develop spaces We celebrate neighborhoods. We build waterfronts. From big to small, we transform the ordinary into compelling. During this one day in DC, our tools are our hands, our eyes, our voices, our people, our city. DC, where we inspire, envision, develop, educate, where we change the world, where we DC. Tomorrow, it will be one new day in DC. It will bring with it new opportunities, new spaces, new ideas. What will you do tomorrow in DC? Be bold, innovative, creative, inspiring. Welcome to the Washington, D.C. Economic Partnerships Entrepreneur Roadmap Speaker Series, focusing on starting or growing a nonprofit in Washington, D.C. We're all really glad that you're here. My name is Erica Moore, and I'm the manager of technology and entrepreneurship at the Washington, D.C. Economic Partnership. And on behalf of our entire team, we're really glad that you're here, and we look forward to helping you grow your business in D.C. At this time, I would like to thank our corporate sponsors for their incredible support, especially the SBA and Ralph Buchanan. Most of you got the invitation from Ralph. Um, also, Venable, our wonderful host, Verizon, DSLBD, Jennifer Schaus, and Capital One. WDCEP is a public private partnership and a nonprofit organization, so this program is very special to us. And our goal is to actively position, promote, and support economic development and business opportunities throughout Washington, D.C. And we do this through a variety of programs and initiatives aimed at four major outcomes. And those are business traction, business development, research and data, and marketing the city. So first, we attract new businesses to D.C. by facilitating the city's presence at national conferences, marketing the district externally as a vibrant and sustainable economy rich with business and investment opportunities. At South by Southwest, we showcase local tech and creative sides of our federal city. This supports DC's efforts to expand, promote, and attract businesses in the tech and creative economy sectors. At the International Council of Shopping Centers, it's a meeting that attracts over 30,000 retailers, developers, and bankers, where we continue to promote DC as a top retail market. WDCP also partners up with the Washington Business Journal to host space finding tours, giving entrepreneurs, brokers, and retailers insight into opportunities in DC's commercial corridors. We also connect business owners like you to available real estate around the district, so let us know if any of you are looking to expand your current business from somewhere else into the city or looking to start your own first brick and mortar here. WDCP is also committed to business development in DC. One way we do that is by hosting this monthly Entrepreneur Roadmap speaker series. And as you know, this program walks you through different aspects of doing business in the, in the district. Accelerate DC is our program that supports the tech sector throughout the year through an, a team-based startup mentoring program and educational programming. Our next vehicle for economic development in the city is research and data. Our annual development report focuses on all the economic and real estate developments focused on retail, education, hospitality, office, and residential space. Our neighborhood profiles, provide demographic information for over 54 unique neighborhoods in the city. And we have a limited supply of these publications here today, but come down to our office or you can download them all on our website, wdcep.com. The last uh, publication we have here is the Emerging Corridors 
which uh, focuses on a handful of specific neighborhoods in the city that have some evolving opportunities for retail and restaurants. And then we have our economic and fiscal impact study that shows the impact that we're having on the city um, every day. Our last mechanism for economic development is marketing DC as the best place to live and work. We do that at our annual meeting and econ showcase, which is coming up. And through our maps of the month on our website, we DC marketing campaign, as many of you have seen probably throughout our Twitter and Facebook, and through features and blog posts on WDCEP.com. We hope that you'll visit our website to learn a little bit more about what we're doing and come to see any of our staff after the program to, to learn a little bit more as well. And without further ado, I would like to start our program by introducing our first speaker, Glenn Ogilvy. If Glenn could make his way up, great. Uh, Glenn Ogilvy was named Chief Executive Officer of the Center for Nonprofit Advancement in 2008. And before joining the center, Glenn served as president and CEO of Earth Conservation Corps, where he developed structured environmental workforce development, leadership and service programs for disconnected youth in Washington, DC, and built staff, board, and organizational capacity with a focus on long-term sustainability. A leader with more than 15 years of experience in the metropolitan Washington nonprofit sector, Glenn is passionate about addressing the issues affecting communities throughout the region. Thank you so much, Glenn. We're happy to have you. So, thank you. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Oops, sorry. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, we can do better than that. Let's wake this room up. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. Well, I want to thank you guys for being here and thank Erica for that great introduction. I think when you ask for a bio, for me anyway, I'm going to start to just submit one sentence uh, because it's never short enough. Uh, thank you for doing that. Um, so I want to thank you all for being here and thank you for your interest in starting or growing a nonprofit. Um, I'm really excited about the work that's happening here at the Washington, D.C. Economic Partnership and the interest of all of our individuals in starting organizations. So I'm going to share with you all for the next 10 minutes uh, some of what you need to know to not just start an organization, but also to be very successful. Um, what I will tell you just as I begin to move into my points is that organizations start with one individual who is really passionate about solving a problem. And that individual is able to organize others around him or her to actually get started. Uh, but getting started is just the very beginning. Uh, there are very many organizations that never make it off of the shelf, meaning they get their tax exempt status. They were passionate, but the day job and, real, and the real world actually kicks in and they never go any further. So our job today is to make sure that anyone here who actually decides to start actually gets off the shelf and has strong outcomes for the community. Is that right? see a lot of heads nodding. I think we're waking up now um, slowly. So I am going to talk to you about building your nonprofit. And then after me, you'll hear from Tom and Vincent about uh, registering and financing. So we're starting with the end in mind. How many of us are familiar with Martin Scorsese and his films, movies? So you know at the beginning of the movie, you see the end. And then during the course of the movie, you see what got you to that point. That's what we're doing this morning. Is that OK? Excellent. So I'm going to give you guys a few quick points. And the first is about your charitable purpose. Before you start an organization, you need to know what that purpose is and be passionate about it and understand that you are actually going to be solving a problem in the community. Um, we want to be able to understand that and do some research to understand that there aren't any additional organizations doing the same exact thing. And the reason we do that research is because if there are, then it's in our best interest to partner and align with those organizations rather than start something new. So it's an opportunity to create some efficiencies and to collaborate. We really promote collaboration at the Center for Nonprofit Advancement because it's really important to have the greatest possible impact, and that's one way to get there. Um, the other thing is we really have to have a solid ability to tell our story. Uh, whenever we tell a story about an issue impacting the community, we want to be able to share some data if we have that, some real examples of how this issue is impacting the community, and then how we intend to solve or make some progress on that particular challenge. So charitable purpose, um, statement of the problem, outlining that issue, and then what your organization will do, how you will make strides to helping um, to solve that challenge. Uh, the third point I'm going to make is about our network. It's really important to have good people around you. They say that even as leaders of organizations and as founders, we are only as strong as our team. So as start, when you're starting an organization, you have an opportunity to build that team from scratch. You are going to need solid board members. We talk about board members who have expertise in key and core areas. Legal is one of those areas. Uh, finance is another. Um, we like to have board members who have fundraising capabilities because you'll hear more later about how important those funds are. And um, it's also important to have someone who has a good grasp of the program you are planning to put forward. 
So it's not just you with the fantastic idea that you're passionate about and working to solve. You have a thought leader and a partner to help you strategize and create ways um, and a means to kind of move forward. Uh, the fourth point I'll share with you is about starting small. I think oftentimes I hear people say, you know, don't sacrifice a base hit for your attempts to hit a home run, all these sports analogies. Um, but really starting small is important because doing something is far better uh, than doing nothing at all. And you can plan and plan and plan and never get off the ground. Another important reason for starting small is because you need outcomes. You need to measure something that you can tie back to your story and show that you truly are able able and capable of having the impact that you're thinking to put forward. So start small, measure those outcomes, and be able to articulate those outcomes in a way that makes your story even stronger. Education and training is the fifth point that I'll make. Really, really important to come to the table with what you already know, but to continue to pick up steam and to build. The environment is consistently changing around us, so what you had as the perfect way to address the problem five years ago may not be the best way anymore. So continuing to utilize education opportunities and professional development, training and technical assistance to build your organization as you continue to move forward is really important as well. Uh, number six, I'm going to touch on fundraising a bit because we like to say at the Center for Nonprofit Advancement, no money, no mission. Without the resources you need to carry out that mission, you're really going to stall, right? So fundraising is truly important. And you really want to hit fundraising in five core areas and hit all of those areas all the time. Those five areas are corporate. You want corporate dollars from the community of corporations that are doing business in that same, in that same environment. Um, foundations, there are private foundations that can support your organization that you want to have partnerships with. Uh, you guys have the same interest in mind, which is stronger communities and stronger people uh, in those communities. Individuals, there's a large group of individuals who care about your charitable purpose who will contribute uh, to the work that you're doing if you tell a strong enough story. Uh, the final two, one is government, which we know well. Uh, we are all working on behalf of those constituents, so partnering with government is helpful. And then the fifth, which is the most elusive, is earned income. Finding ways that to earn income for your charitable purpose. I guess a quick and easy example is, you know, young people who are participating in an after-school tutoring program, uh, maybe they're in a challenged community and they're unable to afford it. But then there are some young people who are in a neighboring community whose parents maybe can't afford it. So those parents may pay a fee that helps to subsidize the young people that aren't able to afford it. So that's an earned income strategy. And that strategy can cut across environmental organizations, health organizations, you name it. But building that earned income is important. All five buckets are important because when you have uh, challenges to the community, any one of those buckets can sort of dry up at any one point, right? So you want to be able to rely on the others. And if you have the perfect storm, which is the recession we just went through, you want to have operating reserves that can hold you until things get better. Um, so that's my, uh, my sixth point. Number seven, which actually could also be number one, is leadership. Every founder uh, believes that he or she is a great leader, but the proof is in the pudding, and a lot of that proof comes to fruition when you start managing your organization. You've got a board to manage. You're managing up for your board members. You've got a staff to grow and manage. So your leadership is really going to dictate how well the organization operates and functions. Uh, a few things we like to say and talk about. One is hire slow and fire fast. It's some advice that I got when I first started my first position as president and CEO actually at Earth Conservation Corps. And it means to really take the time to make sure you're bringing the right person onto your team. They have the right culture. They're the right fit. Uh, but then people change. So when you get that gut feeling that this person is no longer the right person, you really want to work them out of the organization because what you're sacrificing, if you don't, is your mission and the people that you're here to serve. And the way we move people out, one, we like to redirect people. These are three R's. We like to redirect people. If the job that they're doing is no longer the best for them, let's find another place in the organization for them. Um, second, we like to retrain them. Maybe they forgot all of that training and education we put forward. Let's get them some more. And the final um, R is to release them. And that's another term for fire. We don't like those harsh terms in the nonprofit sector. I'm going to take a few seconds just to sort of blaze you guys through these slides. I know my time is coming to a close. And then I'll, um, I'll move over for our next speaker. Um, one is what we do at the Center for Nonprofit Advancement. We are an association of about 1,000 organizations, 400 of which are in the District of Columbia. We do education, about 100 classes per year. Uh, networking we do in a really strong way, bringing like-missioned organizations together to share with one another. 
uh, advocacy locally and also on the Hill, and then group buying, your health insurance, your financial management, your HR services, all portable, bringing those things in, helping our nonprofits to save money, build their effectiveness and make connections. You don't have to be a member to take our classes, our conferences, our forums, so check us out at nonprofitadvancement.org. This is what our membership looks like small and large, from the startup organization that just started yesterday to the $85 million nonprofit that's been successful for 100 years. So networking is really powerful to bring organizations together to share with one another. And you'll see that human services is the largest grouping of organizations uh, in our membership. Um, District of Columbia, there are a lot of nonprofit organizations that are registered. Those are the ones I talk about. You know, some may be on the shelf because they never took off. About 8,000 are actually filing Form 990. That's the finance form that the IRS requires you to file to maintain your tax exemption. You'll hear more about that. Three Cs, uh, we all, we're all about letters. The Rs, now the Cs. Three Cs for survival, conserve. Conserve resources, be as efficient as you can. Maximize every dollar. Collaborate with other organizations to keep your costs low. And then consolidate. If there's an opportunity, and that's the alternate to the merge, to the M word, there's an opportunity to bring two organizations together for greater efficiency. Let's not be afraid of that. Let's look at ways that we can get that done. And then um, finally, issue areas, board governance. We're not picking the right boards. We're not challenging our board members when they're not right. We're not telling the story as strong as we can and marketing our organizations and our brand. Fundraising is a big challenge in the area. And then measuring those outcomes. There used to be a time where anecdotes were good enough. The kids are learning because they're smiling. We're not getting investments for that anymore. You need data. You need to show what their increases actually are. And then last but not least, I'd love to end here, because many of our leaders in our organizations continue to do the same thing over and over again and wonder why we're not being funded. Uh, and it's just the definition for insanity, right? So doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. The question is what we will do differently as we start and grow our nonprofits. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Glenn. Next up, we have Vincent Parker. Thank you. Mr. Parker is currently the Administrator for Business and Professional Licensing at the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. In this role, Mr. Parker oversees business licensing, corporate registration, occupational and professional licensing, consumer protection, and other divisions related to business regulation in the district. Prior to this role, Mr. Parker served as the Business Compliance Manager and Vending and Special Events Manager at DCRA. Mr. Parker previously served as an ABC investigator for ABRA, and Mr. Parker is a graduate of Frostburg State University as an Army veteran. Thank you so much for your service, and thank you for being here. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank the uh, Economic Partnership for having this event. I love coming to these. Uh, this is maybe the third or fourth one we've done. Uh, it's always a great turnout and a great event. Um, so DCRA, if you are in business in DC, the reality is you're coming to DCRA. That includes nonprofits. Um, don't seem so excited. Some people don't, don't, don't like when I say that. Um, but it's a new day. I'll start by saying I encourage everyone to give us a chance. Come experience the service we have, uh, the services we offer to our customers. Uh, you'll be impressed. If you're not, you can email me, call me, and we'll, we'll get it right. Uh, we have some staff I want to identify here. These are the experts who get it done. Melanie Henderson, Jackie Noisette, uh, Nicole McClendon, and Ben Case. Um, these are the individuals who you will work with, with your nonprofit organization or any business to get the answers you need and the things you get, need to get done, done. Uh, so of course, everyone knows what a nonprofit is here, hopefully. Um, it, it's my favorite category of corporation, at least, because there's a, an element of passion. Uh, we have a lot of corporations we deal with, and we'll talk through that. Um, but when we work with nonprofits, there's uh, an interest in the city and the interest in the passion of the business that they're offering or the service that they're offering. Uh, and, and that sets them apart for me. Uh, again, we, we deal with everyone. Um, but nonprofits, again, bring that passion, and that's important for us. Uh, the superintendent of corporations is a statutory position housed at DCRA. Uh, so when you have your corporate document from DC, there's a seal on it from the superintendent of corporations, uh, and that is one of the divisions that we manage at DCRA. So it's very important that you understand our role and how we help you register your corporation. There are approximately 100,000 registered entities in the District of Columbia. Uh, this includes LLCs, um, corporations, partnerships, limited liability partnerships, and a lot of other types of entities. We can talk through all of those. 
Um, but the one we're here to talk about is, of course, nonprofit entities. Uh, they're approximately one third of the total population. Uh, DC is the nonprofit capital of the United States per capita. Uh, there are more nonprofits here than anywhere else. Uh, and that's a function, obviously, of the, the, the physical location as well as the resources that are here. Uh, so because of that, we deal with nonprofits a lot. We understand some of the challenges you all have with regulation uh, in various states uh, from, from where you're located to where you want to come, and we work with you all on a daily basis. There are two types of nonprofit, foreign and domestic. Um, foreign does not mean from another country. Foreign means from another state in this instance. Um, the way we look at it is a domestic nonprofit entity is one that's born in the District of Columbia. A foreign nonprofit entity is born somewhere else and resides in the District of Columbia. Uh, it's important to understand that a nonprofit organization can be born elsewhere and operate in the District of Columbia. You won't have to create a new nonprofit to operate in the district. Uh, your nonprofit can be in Delaware, where most of our, a lot of them are. It can be, um, well, not necessarily nonprofits. LLCs are in Delaware, but it can be elsewhere and, and reside here. The fee is $80, regardless if you're foreign or domestic. Um, if you are a foreign entity, you'll have to receive a letter of good standing from your home state. Uh, wherever you're from, they'll have to certify that you are of good standing, you've paid your fees, you filed your reports, and then you can come register in the District of Columbia um, as a foreign entity. After you've registered, you'll get a certificate of authority. That's the form I identified where it will be stamped by the superintendent of corporations indicating that your nonprofit is registered in the district, either as foreign or domestic. A key part of the nonprofit registration process is the attainment of the 501c3 status or the federal nonprofit status or, or however you want to describe it. Um, DCRA doesn't process those applications. That, of course, is the federal mandate of tax-exempt status. We encourage entities to come to DCRA first to create their nonprofit entity, either as foreign or domestic, and then pursue that 501c3 status. I've heard talking to some people here, it can happen in the, in the inverse way where you can potentially, if you're a foreign entity, take that entity to obtain 501c3 status and then register in DC. Um, but it's cleaner, we can help more if you come to us first, uh, is the way we'll describe. So a lot of nonprofit entities um, will operate from a location in the District of Columbia. If you're a home-based business, this doesn't necessarily apply. But if you are a um, housing or a program that offers outpatient services or, or a program that offers uh, tutoring from a facility. Um, you will need a location in the District of Columbia, and nonprofits are still required to obtain a certificate of occupancy for anything other than a one-family home. So that is if you have an office space, um, if you have a tutoring center, if you have a uh, training center, those facilities themselves are required to be registered and have a certificate of occupancy. That confirms that the zoning is appropriate, how many people can be there, and again, that's important as you go down the road uh, further trying to get funds and identify what your purpose and the use of the space is going to be. The part about corporations that people don't sometimes forget, or people sometimes forget, is that there's a law and statute that says in the District of Columbia, anyone who makes money is required to have a business license. Nonprofits sometimes will think that they're not necessarily generating revenue in the same way that an inline business is. Um, but the statute is clear that they are still required to obtain a business license if they are soliciting revenue. If, they're a, if a nonprofit is going out soliciting donations uh, or having people pay for a service, um, that is a business under the business licensing statute, and therefore they're responsible for a business license. There are two types of business licenses that a lot of nonprofits get, charitable exempt and the charitable solicitation. I'll talk about the difference between those. Um, but there are also nonprofits who have other types of business licenses. Uh, nonprofit potentially could be a school. Uh, a nonprofit could um, be a daycare center or, or uh, some serv other service provider. Those specialized categories will require additional licenses. The license categories I have listed here are primarily just for the fundraising exercise, the fundraising uh, if you want to have um, an event to raise funds. These are also important because as you pursue grants and funds from other sources, we've been made aware that um, a lot of people who grant these monies require this business license. Uh, they, in addition to the corporate registration, uh, I know at least some of the federal partners that we've talked to will, will require you to be registered as a nonprofit entity as well as licensed to solicit the funds. Uh, so this is a key step if you're, again, looking to gain those funds, you'll need to be registered and licensed. Charitable exempt, this is the free one. Um, 
is reserved for educational and religious institutions. You know, we get applications in this category a lot trying to make a connection to an educational purpose, and they are evaluated. Um, but ideally, it's going to be your standard interpretation of what an educational or religious institution is uh, can qualify for the charitable, charitable exempt. That means they can raise funds for their purpose, um, and the license is free. Charitable solicitation is everything else that qualifies as a nonprofit, but is not religious or educational in purpose. Uh, very strict interpretation of religious and inter educational. Uh, this license is $412 for two years, uh, and again, it allows people to raise money, um, fundraise, solicit donations, um, and pot potentially apply for grants and, and other contracts. Um, one thing I wanted to, to go back, if I could, not too far, is the requirement to apply for a nonprofit. As you're applying for a nonprofit, it's, also, it's important to note, this is the registration part, you will need to have at least one organizer. Um, some of our corporate entity types don't require a person to come forward and identify themselves. For a nonprofit, there's at least one organizer who needs to be identified. You're also going to have your board uh, of directors, but there's a requirement that there's one person, an organizer, who forms the nonprofit corporation. Um, after you get registered as a nonprofit corporation, this is important, and anyone who's new should, should really write this down because a lot of people trip up on this. If you apply for a nonprofit corporation today, your first biannual report is due next year. It's not due in two years. Um, I know it's called a biannual report, but the first one is due the following year. And again, a lot of people get tripped up by that. Um, it's a statutory requirement. Um, from that point forward, they'll be due every two years. And the biannual report is really when you identify first that you're still in existence, you identify who your organizers are, your board members, uh, also your um, registered agent for where you can receive service if we need to mail you something. So it's really important, everyone, tell everyone, if you register at any point in the an annual year, calendar year, the report is due the next calendar year. Even though it's called a biannual report, don't wait two years because what will end up happening is you'll get a notice that you're now late um, and potentially incur some fines. Um, so again, the reporting is due the next year after you file uh, and then every two years thereafter. Um, some of the services at DCRA we offer, uh, we also offer um, the Small Business Resource Center, which Ms. Noisette manages. Uh, this is where we have one-on-one -on -one counseling services. We have pro bono clinics. We have large-scale events all year to help businesses of all types, including nonprofits, um, understand the process of regulation. We'll sit with you. We can match you with an attorney who will sit with you to walk you through the steps you need to get registered. Um, as it relates to the purpose and the why and the, the passion, that's what you'll bring. We'll help you through the process. Um, we'll make sure that you're complying with the laws and regulations that we have in place. Um, and, and in some cases, we can actually connect you with some people who may be able to help you get some resources. Um, Small Business Resource Center in FY17 is actually launching a monthly uh, nonprofit event, um, details of which to follow are to come. But because we understand this is such a large population in D.C. and a lot of people are interested in this, we're going to create specialized programs exclusively for you all to walk through our processes and understand exactly what's needed to be successful. If you're looking at more information, business.dc.gov, DCRA's new website for business licensing, uh, it'll give you a checklist. You can provide information about what you want to do, and it will give you a checklist of what you need to do, in what order, where do you need to go to get it. Uh, again, this is new. We launched it about three weeks ago, and it's really helping people understand our processes. Because I understand that they could be somewhat confusing, especially because we do this every day, all day. This would likely be someone's first time doing it. So we, we understand that and try to make sure our processes are clear enough where someone can understand uh, and jump right on the horse and run with it. It's contact information, as I said to start, anyone challenge me. You'll get good service at DCRA. You'll get the answers you need, and we will help you on your way to success. In registering your nonprofit corporation. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vincent. And if you haven't been to business.dc.gov, do it. It'll help you tremendously. It's a really incredible resource, and all of them are wonderful. We're so glad that you're here and that you're in this in the district. So now we have Tom Nida. With more than 49 years of experience in banking and finance, Tom Nida currently serves as Executive Vice President and Managing Director of Community Development and Nonprofit Banking for United Bank, based in DC. 
Long active in community organizations, Tom has served on boards for the DC Public Charter School, Charter School Development Corporation, DC Students Construction Trades Foundation, the Washington DC Economic Partnership, and represents United Bank with the Greater Washington Board of Trade and the US Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Nida has a personal focus on community development with emphasis on financing for nonprofits, educational institutions, developers of affordable and work workforce housing and local governments using tax exempt, tax credit, tax increment, and tax assessment financing wherever possible. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you, Tom. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, you have a handout that should be in front of you, two pages. And I'm going to go one up on Glenn. He gave you three C's. I'm giving you five. <laughs> but let me talk a little bit about what we're going to cover here in the next few minutes. This is a program that is a very condensed version of something I've done many years uh, at various uh, schools of business around the DC metropolitan area. And a couple of things that are probably worth noting right up front. When I've done this five C's of credit, and I've done it in particular with graduate uh, business classes, one of the challenges I pose to the students is, as we get into this, to think about how many other terms they can produce that begin with a letter C that might be relevant to the issue of finance. And I will tell you, the all-time record so far, I'm um, waiting to have it bested, was a total of 57 different terms that all began with the letter C. Think in terms of things like communication, culture, coordination, cash flow, and on and on. The other thing I want to clarify is we've been talking so far about nonprofits with a specific focus on 501c3. That is part of the IRS code, section 501. C3 deals with the, what people think of normally as nonprofits, which is you know, charitable, philanthropic, educational, religious. And those are the ones that are typically only tax exempt. However, if you go to the IRS code, you will find there are 29 types of nonprofits, only one of which, the C3, is tax exempt. This would include things such as credit unions, labor unions, membership and trade organizations, lobbying firms, a big one here in DC. And so there is a lot more to the nonprofit community than you might think on the surface. What I want to talk about today is these five C's of credit. Now, these five C's were intended toward uh, focusing on lending. So if you are looking at funding as a source of, of supporting your organization, where you see the C that says collateral, right beside that, right in the word, this doesn't begin with C, unfortunately, uh, asset or reserves, because it's a factor that people that are your funders, who are not necessarily lenders, will be looking for. So what are we talking about here? Well, there's a lot of ways to acquire funds to support your organization. One of the categories that is common throughout any type of funding request is that you have to demonstrate that your organization, whether it's in, up here and, and waiting to be developed or one that's been around for a while, it has a mission that's clear, it's a mission that's achievable, and it's a mission that's sustainable. And what you end up with is trying to come up with a case that you can make first off for yourself and for your governing board, and then for other funders, whatever they may be, that helps to say that the money that is going to come your way from that source is going to be something that's going to achieve its purpose. Now, in my case, when I'm working with nonprofits and I'm looking at the issue of making a loan, of course, one of my primary objectives is to get it back. <laughs> Most other funders don't necessarily want it back, but want to know that it's done it's achieved what they expected it to do. Sometimes you'll find there are strings attached that might be restrictions or covenants or, or compliance issues that have to be maintained in order to keep the funding or to get more. One of the things you have to understand here is that as funders look at you, they're going to look at you in a way that they want to get a sense of not only who you are, but frankly, how do you stack up against others doing the same thing in the same place at the same time? because they want to put their money where it's going to have the most impact. So let's talk about these five C's a little bit, and then and I will, uh, we'll chew on this a little bit more, perhaps in the Q&A after. So in terms of what I listed on the page there, one of the most important things that is clearly underappreciated is the notion of character. Now, what do I mean by character? It's not something you quantify normally. 
if I'm talking about being a banker lending for consumer credit, I'm going to reflect on your character as it's evidenced by your credit score, okay? Because I don't know who you are, probably, but I can get a sense of how you handle your obligations from that mechanism. If you're a for-profit business, I can pull up a Dun & Bradstreet report or other types of credit information and get a sense of who you are. As a nonprofit, one of the things you have to do is to be able to say, here is my character as evidenced by my reputation, okay? If the reputation is all wrapped around your founder, that's fine. But the issue is sometimes you have to think more broadly than that. So character can be a situation that reflects not only the founder, but what the founder has done in terms of building a staff when the time is appropriate, to be able to recruit a, and retain a board that can be in a position to give them the support and guidance to go forward. But the idea fundamentally for me is character comes down to a one basic word, and that word is trust. Do I trust you enough to do business with you? Because I will tell you, after almost 50 years in this business, the first rule of banking in terms of lending is you do not lend money to somebody you don't trust. I don't care how good their case is, how big their numbers are, you know, there are, there's an issue of trust that I will be more willing to give somebody who doesn't look great on paper an opportunity if I know, if I have a sense, if I have a knowledge that they're going to pay me before they eat, okay? That they give me priority in terms of what I want. What you need to be thinking about is how do you present yourself? What is your brand? What is your reputation to the people you're looking to reach out to? Not just for the people you serve, but for the people who are going to provide the funding for those whom you serve. Second character, the second issue here is one of capacity. This is where you look at, so what are you capable of doing? One of the things you look at is outcomes. Glenn mentioned this before. You know, it's not to the point where it's soft and fuzzy anymore. Well, you feel good, so you must be doing good. Uh, it's more than just a friendly smile and a handshake. The issue is, what difference did you make? And so the question is, if I give you more money, if I'm giving you a grant, if I'm giving you a contract, if I'm giving you a program-related investment, not just a loan, how do I know what you're going to do with that money? And, and, you know, what kind of case can you build for me? And I want to feel good because I have to explain to my people, you know, when I give you this grant, this contract, whatever, that my money was done, used to make the appropriate outcomes. And if you ever want more from me, you better be able to make your case. The third category here is collateral. Uh, that's from a lending standpoint. Think of it as assets otherwise. It's what have you done so far to bring assets together? You know, you may not be asset rich. You may be idea rich. But if you've been able to amass any assets for your organization, the question is how do you use them? How do you deploy them? If I've got a situation where I want to see how you've done, I want to see what you've done with your money and what you've done in terms of building the su sustainability of your organization. So if you have a situation where you go through a lean period, do you have reserves to sustain yourself? If you're in a situation where you have a need for facilities, okay, the facilities itself may be something you lease, you may own it, um, but what good is it doing you? I mean, what difference are you making when it's all said and done? Uh, the question here is, as you are accumulating resources, if you're in a for-profit business, you're probably going to pay out a lot of resources in the form of dividends or things of that nature to your shareholders. In your case, you've got stakeholders, and you're not paying them in cash. You're paying them in terms of other types of outcomes that they have a strong interest in. And so what you want to be sure of is that you can show, if you're given the chance to build your organization, to build your base of operations, to build your reserves, what you're proving is that you're more likely than others to have a sustainable organization. And that's something that cannot be underestimated. Fourth category is capital. Now, in no nonprofits, you're going to call it net assets. Basically, it's the difference between your assets and your liabilities. And what you want to say, and this ties into your reserves and other assets, is that over time, you've been able to accumulate capital. Because capital, in any circumstance, is your cushion. There's another C word. Um, but it's your cushion for the things you cannot expect or the things you couldn't predict or the things you can't control. So the issue here is that that is your buffer, if you will. Now, the last thing here is conditions. This is the wild card. Because if you look at those five Cs, the first four, you have some degree of control over. The last one, you don't. It's what's happening now. 
things that are going on. You know, what are interest rates today? How's the economy doing? What's the job market looking like? How much support am I getting from the D.C. government or the federal government? You know, who's supporting me? Did my major funder just drop dead and now I have nobody else to go to? You know, things of that nature. And the question is, you look at conditions as they exist, and what you want to really be smart about is to think about giving yourself the opportunity in advance to give yourself scenarios. So you have what may be your best case, your worst case, and your most likely. What have you done to position your organization to sustain itself through all three scenarios? And be able to update that. The worst thing in the world to do is to do like a strategic plan. Really nice, leather bound, on the shelf, gathering dust because it hasn't been seen in years. And so a situation is one that you look at conditions as something that is a dynamic situation. Anytime something goes on, I'll give you a condition coming up. It's called a presidential election. Do you think any of that outcome might have an impact on what you might be doing or thinking about? Absolutely. So the issue here is you look at this blend of these five factors. Now, here's a little trick to give you a sense of how good you are in terms of how you look on paper to somebody who might be giving you some funding consideration. You take those five seats, and then you have to be brutally honest. Evaluate your organization on each of those seats, as you understand it. Talk to your board about this. Talk to your staff about it. And for every C in that list that is a strength, give yourself 20 points. If it's OK, well, not stellar. Give yourself 10. And if it's like, oh, this ain't no, there's no way. It's, it's clearly a weakness, or I haven't got a clue. Give yourself zero. Add up your points. The total of points is going to be your rough probability of success in getting funding from any source. Now, what it does is it gives you an opportunity to say, what are my weaknesses? And what do I have to do to address those weaknesses to get that little score up to an acceptable level? It gives you a nice benchmark or framework to determine not only your current level of success, but maybe your probabilities of continued success. And it's an exercise you have to run at least annually, maybe more frequently, every time you do a budget, every time you put together a major grant request, or you go to a bank to borrow, you need to update that. And that really gives you a sense of how does your organization look first off to you, because this is a self-assessment, but also then how can you present it in the best light to somebody else who might be considering for funding. Last thing I've got is page two of your handout. What you'll find there is an interesting exercise. What I've done is I've listed a whole bunch of risk factors. Now, this is the banker me coming out. Everything's got risk associated with it. And so there's lots of different categories of risk. And one of the things you want to do is figure out what your mitigants are for those risks. And the exercise is simply to figure out, when you have time, take this with you and run it past your staff or your uh, spouse, as the case may be, and simply say, so what lines connect to what? Now, here's the trick. There's no wrong answer. Every line connects to every factor. And so the more you see that, the more then you broaden your thinking about, so how do I work this to my advantage? How can I take it? And I will tell you something. Whether you're coming to me as a banker or you're coming to me as a fundraiser or whatever, if you give me a presentation that is couched in terms of these five C's of credit, or five C's of capacity, then you're going to make a much better case. And your probability of success in terms of getting money is just uh, skyrocket. So thank you for that. I'm going to get started with Q&A. First question, just an uh, information question. Yes. Will, will, will we be able to get the slides from this? Sure, oh, absolutely, okay. yeah. Okay. I'll send the slides out after. And we'll also have the recording. So in a couple of weeks, we'll have the recording as well. So you can watch the whole thing with okay. the slides. Yep. I think this probably goes to Glenn. I was with someone yesterday, and they were applying for a grant at the federal government, and they were not able to to submit it because they didn't have a SAMS number. I didn't even know what a SAMS number is. Can you help me? Yeah, I believe the SAMS number is something that's con you know um, related to the federal application. Um, so you always hear the DUNS number. Uh, your tax ID number and several others, but the SAMS is specific to the federal government, so we need to do some more research to understand that. And that's actually a new term that I've just began to hear myself. Good morning. My question is for uh, Vince Parker. Mm -hmm. I'm a resident of Maryland, but I want to start my nonprofit in D.C. 
Sure. Well, it, <clears throat> will I be considered a foreign entity or because the nonprofit is based in D.C., would it will stand in D.C.? You, your, your personal residency doesn't play uh, into the status of the entity. The entity can be based in the District of Columbia if you reside in Maryland, as long as you have a registered agent in the district. So the registered agent is the person when we mail things, when we need to serve things, that registered agent needs to be a residential, per a person who lives in a residential property in the District of Columbia who will serve on your behalf to receive that service uh, and any other document that we have to send to you. So you can reside in Maryland as long as on your initial application you identify your registered agent as being someone in the district, your entity can be registered in D.C. as a domestic uh, entity in D.C. Okay. One, one more question mm -hmm. for you. In, in regards to um, location, I actually haven't found a true location, so this person that I have in D.C., I could use that address for the location in right. all the mailings? Right. Yes. Okay. You could use it, their home. Okay. Yes. That you couldn't necessarily conduct... You could conduct uh, certain business activities from your home, certain things you can't conduct from your home. Um, but bookkeeping, record keeping, all that stuff is fine from, from a home. I would like to know what are some of the things that qualify you for a grant? I'll touch on that. So a lot of our funders have uh, different sets of requirements as well as different formats um, for their proposals. What you'll first see is a request for proposals, normally referred to as an RFP and that will lay out the questions for you and some of the criteria. But one of the first requirements is that you be a registered 501c3, a tax-exempt entity, uh, for most of our organizations that supply funding. Good morning. I represent a coalition of nonprofit organizations, and um, since you all are a huge resource, what are challenges that you have all seen for nonprofit coalitions, and what is your advice for them? Yeah, I think... Um, you, you heard this earlier with Tom relative to the banking relationship. But I think trust is often a, an, a common denominator for a challenge with coalitions uh, because it's always a question of who's on first and who's leading. Uh, when resources come to the table, it gets even more complicated. So I would recommend solid agreements that really lay out who is doing what um, and how and when and a good timeline and some accountability measures. Uh, and also to start small, to build trust as you go before jumping into that huge uh, grant opportunity as a team. Yeah, let me comment on that too. I think one of the the uh, ironies of forming coalitions or things of that nature is on the one hand, you're hoping for collaboration and maybe critical mass. On the other hand, you may be engendering competition. Uh, and so you have to try to balance those two things out. I think one of the real issues is to make sure that the mission of your coalition is clearly stated and that everybody who's going to be active does subscribe to it actively um, because otherwise you're just going to get a lot of polarization it's just going to fragment your organization and it will become completely ineffective and for me it's been the one that comes to mind has been an issue where uh, one of the member organizations of the coalition uh, may have issues with members or, or board board members and they fall into a status that affects negatively the rest of the coalition members so um, you know it's been a regulatory issue from my experience but it's probably across the board in all areas related to your operation but um, it's been a stat issue where one of the members potentially falls out of compliance um, and negatively affects the rest of the coalition's ability to pursue sources of funding or, or things like that yeah, I think playing off of that a little bit is the fact that, you know, as you often will see uh, dynamic, maybe charismatic leaders with an individual nonprofit, you can end up with a dominant figure in a coalition, and the coalition is them, not the rest of the group. And so you want to make sure there's a balance between the visibility and the impact of all the members, not just residing in one or two. What do you recommend to start with that? Oh, she's asking what what do you recommend for that that's, yeah. well i'm not I'm not really into the recommendation business <laughs> as much as some of the others uh, um but but what I will tell you is that fr from my perspective, compliance is one of the first things you need to secure as you're looking to pursue funding sources. You need to make sure everyone's paid their taxes, everyone you know no one's on the run, you know you want to make sure everyone's in line 
Um, because so many times we've heard of people coming to us with an emergency situation because they didn't do that front end work. They didn't check all the boxes on the application. They didn't make sure the individuals had the proper status to do what they wanted to do in the long run. So I just encourage you to, on the front end, go in and assume nothing. Check everything, even of your partner organizations. Um, but again, I, I don't give advice, but, but, but that's what I can say. <laughs> You know, I'll add to that very quickly that um, it's important to have someone watching the ball from a compliance standpoint at all times because the compliance requirements often change. When you have a bunch of people and a bunch of organizations that are so laser focused on the mission and the passion, sometimes that, that may go away. So yeah. assigning that role to someone, being a part of an organization greater than yourselves that continue, get, continue to feed you uh, compliance items as they change is really important. Once you establish your name and your brand and What's your mission? What would be the next step after you establish your, your name and your foundation? Okay, uh, I'm gonna repeat that. It looks like Oscar's having an mm -hmm. issue. Um, so the question is, after you've established your brand, your vision, your mission, all of that, what's the next step? Do you go to a banker first? Do you look for funding? Do you set your metrics? What's the next step? Yeah, from my perspective, I would say to get started. And we talk about starting small. Um, so you'd like an opportunity to test your program uh, even if it is with a small amount of people, so you have some measurable outcomes. Those outcomes, uh, you know, coordinated with your story, will make for a much better pitch uh, to potential investors. I would think that one of the things, like starting any new organization, whether it's for profit or nonprofit, is to be serious about providing seed capital to get started, unless it's purely going to be all volunteers. What you have to do is figure out where's the initial money coming from? Who's going to provide the initial support? This may help you define, you know, a board of directors, for instance, and, and how they can help you. But, you know, the issue is if you haven't got the means, either yourself or with your strongest supporters, to put some of your money on the table, you're not likely to get money from anybody else because you haven't demonstrated at this point that what you're proposing is achievable or sustainable. So you start that discussion by putting your own resources on the table, not just money, but also time and effort. Uh, that's where you begin to make the case. So my question has to do with perhaps with the next stage in development, which is going beyond the founder. Um, what has been your experience about whether you've seen any key milestones, either developmentally, programmatically, or even financially, that signal it's time for the founder to let other people in or to let things go uh, to help the organization grow, perhaps beyond their own capabilities? I'll give you one word. It's called overhead. If you are in a situation where you're going beyond the mom and pop, then you've got a situation where you're thinking about adding staff, developing programs, acquiring site, you know, applying for grants. That doesn't come for free. Um, the question is, as you are building your overhead, at that point, you are beginning to set some milestones for yourself. And then it's the matter of how much overhead. And once you've identified the overhead, you've got to figure, that's my fixed expense just to operate. I haven't spent a dime yet on my mission for the people I want to serve. But without the overhead, you've got nothing to serve with. Yeah, and I'll say that the number of years in service doesn't dictate a change in the organization's life cycle. Um, so you could be around for 20 or 30 years and still be a very young organization as it relates to the level of sophistication. Um, the founder is needed as long as he or she is capable, innovative, able to open doors. Uh, but it starts with the board. You know, every organization starts with a board. Those three people you need to register could be family members, friends, or colleagues. Those are the people who are going to love all your ideas. They're going to laugh at your jokes and think that it's all great. When you expand that board to people you don't know as well who will challenge you um, and push you from a uh, programmatic standpoint uh, and a financial standpoint, then the organization starts to outgrow and pace itself. My name is Emilia, and this question is for Glenn and also for Tom. So could you please explain me how the communications and marketing line can affect not only the mission, also the funding? Yeah, I'll start by saying communications and fundraising go hand in hand. 
Um, there was a time where communications was sending a fax to a number of people, as many numbers as you had. And now it's so much more complicated. It's social media, it's your website, it's your electronic publications. But the story you tell in those communication mediums is the story that will attract investors. Uh, so communicating outcomes through those same uh, ranges is also very important. Um, it can be done with no budget. Uh, because social media is absolutely free. Um, and then when you start to spend more money, it's on things like your website and hiring people to get you the right, the right newsletter. The other piece I'll say is it also costs you nothing to write a good opinion editorial about the issues facing your organization, uh, the mission of your organization, and getting that placed in the Washington Post, uh, which ultimately gets a lot of readership and brings more people um, to your organization. Thank you. Yeah, I think the key for me is on communication, it starts with the founder. And it goes from the time the founder has the idea to having to communicate in some fashion with the next person. And the idea is you want to have an idea that is worth passing on. And the question is, how do you do that most effectively? Because you can do certain things word of mouth within your network of friends, family, and coworkers. When you go beyond that, you've got to be able to expand on the mechanisms in which you can reach out. And the question is, how much do you want to reach out? It may be premature to go out on a website and be reaching out to millions of people who you will touch ever so little. Maybe the better way is to build a network of people you can meet face to face and get to know you if you're the founder and get to understand from you what your message is, what your mission is, and perhaps hear a personal pitch from you as to how they can help. The broader you go, the shallower it will be. And so what you want to do is start uh, small, narrow, deep, and then expand it gradually. If you try to be all things to all people, all you'll do is have a lot of messaging that has no support to actually deliver what you've been talking about. Thank you all very much for this. My question regards uh, hiring expertise for a you know, as you're a young organization, I imagine you don't need a lot of expertise like accounting, like I'm thinking of legal, one of you mentioned legal, of consultants, et cetera. At what point do you need to start going, I'm not, and I'm not looking for a dollar figure, but just some criteria and guidance, do you need to go out and start hiring professionals for help? And at what point do you actually need to bring them into your organization as in-house accounting, in-house counsel, et cetera? Thank you. Yeah, I think hiring out is the first few phases of your organization. Uh, because you can expand when necessary, when the workload uh, requires it, and then contract. So you're not obligated for you know benefits and salary for those individuals. But once you get a pace where you're consistently needing these services year-round, then it begins to be more cost-efficient to bring them in-house. Um, and there's a realm of services. Legal is one. Financial management is another. Human resources. It's a whole host of things. And even fundraising support that you can outsource until it's time and you're strong enough to bring it in-house. And one of the things that I've developed over the years is what I refer to as a skills matrix. It uh, is particularly effective for nonprofits. And what you do is you think of all the skill sets you're going to want. Now, you don't need them all, all the time. But you take a look at what those skills are. Then you look at you know the board members you have or those you're trying to recruit or those you need to go find. And you take a look at, if you have an existing board, get them to self-evaluate. So in this category, I really know this stuff. And this, I know enough to be dangerous, and this, I haven't got a clue. And what you do is you look for the holes. And you know, my objective has always been, when I'm starting small, just bootstrapping, I want to get everything I can that's basically pro bono or volunteer. There's a point in time when I'm going to take up too much time for people, or I need too much expertise, and I'm going to need to outsource it. And there's going to be a time when my cost benefit of that outsourcing is going to say, I could do it cheaper in-house because my volume is enough that it justifies that. And the issue is, at every stage before you expand, you also look at, so if I have to retrench, how can I peel back from this? And if I have to go back to a core group of volunteers to sustain myself through a tough time, can I do that? Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.